final item of business is members' business debate on motion 13785 in the name of Colin Smith on ban on the export of live animals for slaughter and fattening. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Colin Smith to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and can I thank all members from across the Chamber who signed my motion so quickly to secure cross-party support and make today's debate possible. President Officer, I'm sure at some point during the debate we'll be told that the export of live animals is an emotive subject. Good, because so it should be. Animals aren't cargo, they breathe, they think, and they suffer. And sadly, that can often be the case for animals subjected to live export. Unweaned calves, just a few weeks old, taken from their mothers, not only from one end of the country to another, but onto a different country or countries where we have no say and no control over the conditions they are kept in for their short existence before they are slaughtered. Now, everyone in this chamber, I'm sure, shares the belief that livestock should be reared and ultimately slaughtered as close to the farm as possible. But the reality is, in 2017 alone, hundreds of cattle, more than 3,000 sheep and almost 6,000 calves were exported from Scotland in journeys up to 135 hours. This wasn't for breeding and to be reared elsewhere. It was to be kept for a few hours or days just to be slaughtered or for fattening, which in effect is for slaughter. The recent BBC disclosure documentary on the issue revealed the role Scotland plays in this trade, with p ferries exporting thousands of calves, some of whom were as young as three weeks old, out of Cairn Ryan Port in my South Scotland region, with the full support of the Scottish Government. In response to the documentary's findings, to the credit, p ferries rightly made the decision to end their involvement in the trade, leaving the Scottish Government increasingly isolated in their continued defence of the practice. And all the calves that presumably would have previously been exported through, through Cairn Ryan are being transported to Ramsgate in Kent and shipped across the channel from there, again it seems, with the support of the Scottish Government. Ramsgate was, as many members may remember, the location of an appalling animal welfare incident in 2012. A single lorry carrying more than 500 sheep was declared unfit to travel. 43 sheep had to be euthanised due to injury, six fell into the water and two drowned. A temporary ban on exports was put in place by the local council, but following an injunction by the shippers, the ban had to be lifted on the grounds of EU and existing UK legislation. Since then, there has been a growing call for a change in the law to secure a permanent ban. A year ago, a private member's bill was introduced in the UK Parliament by Theresa Villiers to secure a ban. That bill was ultimately withdrawn in February this year on the basis that the UK government were considering such a ban. And certainly in April, Environment Secretary Michael Gove declared that the UK government were consulting on what they described as all options for future improvements of animal welfare during transport, including the potential ban on their live export for slaughter. How serious the UK government are in the matter does remain to be seen. But what was disappointing was the immediate response of the Scottish Government. The Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy, Fergus Ewan, declared, and I quote, the Scottish Government will not support the banning of live exports of livestock. He went on to say that any such move would potentially do substantial harm to our quality livestock sector, not least farming in the Western Isles, Shetland and Orkney, as well as trade with Northern Ireland. President officer, let's nail that myth. A specific ban on the export of live animals out of the UK would have no impact on the ability of farmers on our island communities to transport their livestock to the mainland. So the Cabinet Secretary's view was not correct. Such a knee-jerk reaction undermines Scotland's hard-earned reputation to always be at the forefront of the highest animal welfare standards, so important to the livestock sector. Scotland does not and cannot compete on the basis of a race to the bottom on animal welfare. We have some of the highest animal welfare standards anywhere in the world, but we should always aim to do better, to continue to build our reputation. Oh, I certainly will, yeah. Fergus Ewing. Does Mr Smith recognise that, quite rightly, the transportation of animals, whether it is export out with the EU, uh, out with the UK, or infra the UK, from the Northern Isles to Aberdeen, for example, must be done in accordance with the same high animal welfare standards and therefore, to suggest that somehow the two issues are entirely different is not factually correct. 
Colin Smith. President officer, what's not factually correct is to say that a specific ban on the export of live animals out with the UK would impact on the ability of farmers on island communities to transport the livestock to the mainland. And also, what is a fact? What is a fact is as soon as an animal leaves these shores to another country, this government loses all control over what happens to that animal. So it's fine to talk about welfare standards in Scotland, but as soon as they're out with Scotland, we have no control. And that's the point of today's debate, and that's the point of banning the export of live animals. We have some of the highest welfare standards, there's no question about that. And we need to continue to build a reputation as a producer of ethically sourced meat, and not argue that if we have a ban on exports from the rest of the UK, somehow Scotland, as Fergus Ewan seems to be implying, should opt out of that ban, a race to the bottom. Now, to be fair, since the comments were made, we have seen a more measured response from the Scottish Government, indicating that they will consider the outcome of the UK Government's consultation. However, the Scottish Government argue that they have not yet found evidence that livestock exported to other EU countries from Scotland is then exported beyond that country. Now, notwithstanding the fact that some other EU countries' welfare standards are not as rigorously enforced as they are in Scotland. As I said, once these animals leave Scotland, their future is entirely out of our hands. Any additional journeys, the conditions they face, the circumstances in which they are killed is all out of our control. If the government believes that the transportation of Scottish livestock across the world in poor conditions is unacceptable, then they simply cannot continue to support a system that allows this to happen. Scotland should be leading the way in making the case for an end to live exports, setting an example for others. Now, I fully understand there are heartfelt concerns about the impact a ban could have on the livestock sector. The lack of a market for veal in the UK has often been cited as a reason for the export of baby calves. But we should be working with the industry to find solutions, not find excuses for inaction. Absolutely. During the debate, others will argue for the development of ruby or red veal in Scotland as a high value, high welfare Scottish delicacy instead of Scottish calves simply being treated as a waste product. We should also consider ways to better support ethical and environmentally friendly farming and in a way that ensures no farmers are put at a disadvantage if they make positive animal welfare choices. The UK is only 75% self-sufficient in beef, so the exporting of young calves is by no means a necessity. There is scope to develop a new approach that supports greater cohesion between the dairy and the meat sector. In my own home region of Dumfries and Galloway, David and Wilma Finlay are leading the way in ethical farming and have rejected the premise of immediately taking calves away from their mothers. They let calves stay with their mothers longer and have found that prioritising animal welfare in this way has not only resulted in healthier livestock, but it's proven more financially viable than first thought due to the significant improvements it makes to productivity and lifespan. Very quickly, please. Is there, is there a case where the government needs to do more to support farmers in terms of developing the type of ethical farming that, that he describes? Uh, Colin Smith, if you could draw your remarks to I, th I think Alex Rowley makes an absolutely vital point. The government are currently considering what will replace the common agricultural policy. We should put animal welfare and environmentally sustainable pro uh, production at the very heart of any future policy. Now, I have great faith in Scotland's agriculture sector. We've seen in the debate over post-Brexit support, they are pragmatic and if anything have been leading the way while us politicians stumble behind. They're also adaptable. If we set the framework, give them the time and support, they will deliver. But, presiding officer, we have to show leadership. We have to listen to our constituents. We have to stop coming up with excuses not to do the right thing. And that means we have to consign to the history books where it belongs, the practice of exporting animals for slaughter and fattening and continue to build Scotland's fine reputation as a food producer of high quality and high animal welfare standards. Thank you. Uh, we move to the open debate and speeches of up to four minutes, please. We have Edward Mountain followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to declare an interest, if I may, and I'd like to go through that. My family used to be involved in a dairy farm, and I, as a, uh, with my family, have a pedigree herd of Simmental cattle that we've had since 1972. I've been an I was an agricultural consultant for 12 years. I've got a degree in land management, a diploma in farm management, and I have hands-on experience of farming since the age of about 16. I'd like to think, therefore, I come to this debate with a certain degree of knowledge. 
Firstly, I'd like to clear some ground rules. There is no farmer in Scotland or any other country that I know that wants to see their stock suffer, and they just won't allow it to happen. All farmers understand that Brand Scotland is something that is very important to Scotland, and we all need to protect it. And I think that all farmers in Scotland believe that we have some of the highest welfare standards in the world, and we're proud of them, and rightly so. Our transport regulations in Scotland are commendably strong, and I believe I can say that having passed the relevant test to allow me to transport <coughs> animals. Now, why do we export animals from Scotland? Well, we export them for breeding, and I will freely admit that some of my stock bulls have gone to Europe, Ireland, and beyond. And some animals do go abroad for fattening. There's no point sending them abroad, though, however, just purely for slaughter. Because let's be brutally honest, it's cheaper to transport them on the hook than it is on the hoof. Now, what are the numbers we're talking about? Well, let's look at that. We don't really know exactly what each export license does because it doesn't specify the exact use. When it comes to cattle, we're probably talking about either breeding livestock in most cases or calves for fattening. And as far as calves go, we are mainly talking about dairy calves. Now let's look at the dairy industry. Whether we like it or not, there is a 50% chance that calves will be born naturally and will be male. There is a 50% chance that they will be born naturally as females. Male calves sadly are not required as part of the dairy industry. And let's be brutally honest, Colin Smith, if I may, that they're not required and not suitable for the high quality beef that we are producing in Scotland. That beef industry is based on specific breeds such as Aberdeen Angus, Charolais, Limousin, Simmental, and of course other native breeds and, and breeds such as Shorthorn. They've been bred for generations for high food, quick maturing, and, and conversion rates that are good to take food to and convert it to muscle. That is the high quality meat production that we are so proud of in Scotland. And they are all the very traits that dairy cows don't have, who are bred for milk and not meat production. To me, for a sensible comparison, it's like trying to compare a weightlifter to a sprinter. Beef cattle will take 12 to 18 months to slaughter, and if we are very lucky, without subsidy, the margin on each animal varies between 100 to 300 pounds, excluding subsidy. Can I just finish this point? Depending on the system and the timings and the price achieved. Now that's not much investment for the entire amount of money that farmers put in to, into it and indeed it takes no account of fixed costs that farmers also have to face. I'll take an interruption. Mike Grumbles. Thank you um, for giving way. Can I just say that there is a tremendous, uh, and the member will know this, there's a tremendous market for veal in continental Europe. Uh, it's not so much a market here but something that could be done in the interests of the producers to help the Scottish Government could help develop that market in the interests of the producers. Edward Mountain, if you could take us up to five minutes, that would be okay. great. Okay. Presiding officer, I, I have some concerns about white veal production, and it's not something that sits comfortably with me as a farmer. And, and, mm -hmm. and if other countries want to do it, that is for them. But it's not a lot of what a lot of farmers would want to do. Now, as I was talking about dairy calves, we would got to the stage where beef from Frisian and Holston cattle will never compete with the quality or the financial return from beef cattle. They're not hardy animals. They need to be kept in in winter. The gross margin on a, on a, on a Frisian bull, if it's being fed, may be as little as 20 pounds. It's not very much. So we've got to look for a solution. And let's be honest, we have to have a solution because we're always going to continue to use milk. We can reduce the risks of male calves by using sex semen, but let's be honest, that doesn't work all the time, but I would encourage it. The other sad thing would be to destroy the male calves at birth, and that's something that farmers find particularly difficult to do. They want to find a use for their animals. Or we could export them to units that have the same standards as us, which I believe we are doing in a lot of cases to Europe. And there could be an argument, Mr. Smith, for not allowing those units to export them to countries that don't have the same abattoir standards that we do in the United Kingdom. That may be worth looking at. But before we decide what we think is morally light, right, let's look at what's possible and then work out what we're going to do. I'm afraid, 
presiding officer, moral indignation on exporting calves doesn't sit right with me because I know that it is done in the most humane way possible. And there are many that make demands on an industry that are not feasible and have huge unintended consequences. And we must be wary of that before we take this motion any further. Thank you, presiding officer. I think I'm going to be a bit stricter on the rest of the speakers. <laughs> Uh, can I have Ruth Maguire to be followed by Claudia Beamish? Presiding officer, animal welfare is an emotive topic. It's an important topic which provokes strong opinions on both sides of the debate. And it's one where my Cunningham South constituents regularly make their views known to me. They tell me of their concern about puppy smuggling, the right to express their opposition to snares, stink pits, mountain hare culls, and raptor persecution. They tell me about their disgust that there are adults in this day and age who think watching a pack of dogs tear a fox to shreds is sport and express their shock that fox hunting still isn't banned. And many have written because they're distressed by the images they've seen of the worldwide phenomenon of animals having to endure long journeys only to be slaughtered at the journey's end. So I thank Colin Smith for securing this debate on banning the export of live animals for slaughter or fattening. I say at the outset that I'm sympathetic to calls from one kind, Compassion in World Farming and the SSPCA to end all long distance live transport of animals for slaughter. Animals are sentient beings. They feel pain and stress the same as us. Animals travelling in cramped conditions with insufficient water supplies, uncontrolled temperatures and inadequate rest periods will suffer. There's no escaping that. As I mentioned, the transportation of animals for slaughter is a worldwide phenomenon and not unique to Scotland. Compassion and World Farming report that each year millions of live farm animals are transported thousands of miles for slaughter or to places where they will be fattened for slaughter. The Scottish Government has previously stated that no one is comfortable with the issue of male dairy calves being exported. The commercial pressures on the dairy industry are huge and require maximum lactation and production from the dairy cow. Calves, in particular male calves, have no value in this process, so the majority are exported for fattening in Spain and then on for slaughter in North Africa. Simply, we cannot guarantee that will be in compliance with the welfare standards that apply here in Scotland. I'm glad that the Scottish Government is supporting the ethical dairy farm, as mentioned by Colin Smith. I hope that they will support other farmers to transition to a more ethical model of farming. Presiding officer, I acknowledge that animals travel for a variety of reasons and that these journeys are essential and an essential part of business for livestock owners and crofters in Scotland. And I recognise that livestock production is an important part of the rural community in Scotland. Jobs are important, the economy is important, but that doesn't diminish the fact that long distance transport of live animals is a serious animal welfare issue and concerns continue to be raised by the people that we represent. Minister Marie Goujon has inherited many of the animal welfare issues that I mentioned at the start of my speech. I've watched her respond to questions on them with sensitivity, with care and professionalism. And I've promised my constituents that I'll keep a keen eye on these matters and do whatever I can to further solutions to their concerns. I trust that the Minister will ensure that our SNP Scottish Government will show by their actions as well as by their words just how committed they are to the welfare of all animals. Thank you. Claudia Beamish, followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And my thanks also go to my colleague, Colin Smith, uh, for bringing this issue to debate. Colin is strongly committed to bettering animal welfare standards in Scotland, and a ban on export of live animals for slaughter and fattening is an important step forward. This is Scottish Labour policy. As my colleagues have described in this debate, the reality of live exports for these purposes is often for very young, unweaned calves facing journeys of significant length, and often in conditions they as farm animals are not built for and should not be subjected to. These are sentient beings, as my colleague Ruth Maguire has said. Members seem mostly in agreement that this is a distressing thought, so surely 
we should be in agreement that there must be a positive solution. In the ministerial statement on the 11th of, of September, the minister stated that the scenes on the BBC documentary shocked her. Yet she went on to say that everything the documentary showed was in line with animal welfare standards. And if Scotland's legal standards allow for the practice that is shocking, this government cannot claim a commitment to animal welfare standards in good faith, in my view. Cows bred for maximum milk production are less useful for beef production, of course. But there are pioneering systems that use herds for both purposes. As Colin Smith described, using larger cows for dairy and breeding them with beef bulls produces calves that could be reared for meat, addressing the difficulties that force farmers to export live calves at present. Very briefly, because I've only got the four minutes. Okay. Edward Mountain. I mean, uh, the point I, I would make is, is breeding dairy cows with bull, with bull beef um, produces a completely different animal. And it's been tried with scimitars. Where you, where, where you get it with Frisians, it doesn't really work. Surely the best way is to produce an animal that's designated for what it's supposed to do, produce milk. Well, um, I thank the member for his Claudia intervention. Claudia Bumish, I can give you a little extra Sorry. time. I, I'm, I'm going on to develop the arguments, which I understand I'm not a farmer, and, and the member is, but um, I'm going on to develop the arguments that I've seen in, in certain places, which um, I hope the member will um, listen to with care as well. Um, this is also a solution. Um, uh, Sorry, the, the, this addresses the difficulties as it, as it develops that force farmers at the moment to export live calves at present. It's also a solution to the greenhouse gas emissions produced by suckler beef, um, an advantage this government would be foolish to disregard. It is fantastic that the two examples of ethical farming of cows uh, can be found in my region of South Scotland. The sight of the calves at David and Wilma Finlay's farm in Dumfries and Galloway warmed the cockles of my heart. The Finleys described their system as, I quote, deliberately de-intensification, unquote, approaching the farm as an integrated food system. Above all, they treat their land, animals, and workers with respect. And also Peelham Farm in the borders rear organic produce and have an on-site butchery. They operate successfully under the simple philosophy of sustainable self-reliance. Scotland's agricultural policy could learn a lot from these inspiring examples. Let's be positive tonight, um, even about Brexit for once. Brexit holds an opportunity to rethink our farming system for the benefit of farmers, our climate change ambitions, and our animal welfare standards. If we change practices in farming, we need to enable farmers to adapt. And I would welcome comment from the Minister on the suggestion of funding for beef and dairy farmers to support them in transitioning to farming systems that do not require live export as an uncomfortable truth and the development of suitable herd breeding programs. Like the ethical dairy pro uh, project in South Scotland, we need to reimagine agriculture as a whole system, combining the needs of production, the ecosystems, the social system, and the animal welfare standards. Taking agro the agroecology approach would mean newborn calves were not considered a useless byproduct, instead exceeding uh, the, the highest, um, in, in, instead, um, we could develop a system which would maintain the highest standards of animal welfare. This shift could truly be in the best interests of farmers. And I, I understand that agroecology could mean that the development, the productive life of the cow is doubled, cutting the need for antibiotics by 90% and bringing more people into jobs on the farm. Clear provenance. There is evidence of this. So uh, some members may laugh, but there is evidence of this clear evidence, which they might like to go and see. Clearer provenance could also help with repopularizing veal in public opinion. And beyond that, it would bring a much needed reduction in the agricultural sector's greenhouse gases by counting beef and dairy herds as one, as one herd. It is vital the government works with the industry on these issues, hears their concerns, and supports the sector to shift to more environmentally friendly farming and to actually ban the export, the live export of animals for fattening and slaughter. Thank you. Everyone will get their say at the appropriate time. Uh, Mark Ruskell, followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Colin Smith for bringing forward this very timely topic for debate here tonight. My own views on the inhumane transport of live calves on six-day journeys to their slaughter in Spain and beyond are well known. 
And I've raised this issue repeatedly in this chamber and directly with the Scottish Government since the start of this year, when the Cabinet Secretary felt the need to express his opposition to a ban to the BBC rather than this chamber. The announcement from P&O Ferries that it would finally enforce its own policy on stopping the shipping of animals intended for fattening or slaughter to Ireland was very much welcome, though it was long overdue. But we shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking that the trade is over. Live exports of young calves from Scottish farms are continuing as we speak. And earlier this month, footage was released showing around 200 young calves heading for the port of Ramsgate in Kent, where they boarded a Latvian registered private ferry headed for Spain. ID tags on the calves show that they had originated in Scotland and some were as young as two weeks old. We are shipping lorry loads of unweaned animals to their deaths. And I've not been able to establish how much of Scotland's live export trade has been diverted via Ramsgate, but I would welcome any update the Minister is able to provide tonight. But what's clear is that without a commitment from the Scottish Government to at least consider a ban, and this cruel trade and the suffering that goes with it will continue under the radar. Now, DEFRA ran a UK-wide consultation on a live export ban over the summer, something which I hope my Conservative colleagues welcomed at, at the time. The UK government has made it clear that a ban could still potentially be the outcome of that consultation. So instead of pressurising a ferry company to circumvent their own policies and begin accepting live exports again, the Scottish Government should be spending their time working with their Westminster counterparts to address the glaring and urgent concerns over animal welfare. Now, we have a rare opportunity to update welfare standards that the European Commission themselves have admitted show poor compliance and poor performance. The current standards were set over 12 years ago before the sentience of animals was legally recognised. And since then, the scientific veterinary evidence has clearly and repeatedly stated that we should avoid transporting young calves as much as possible. We should be embracing this opportunity to consider a live export ban with both hands, not picking political arguments for the sake of it. Now, the Cabinet Secretary says that he doesn't want to do, I think, anything that creates further challenges or difficulty for our farming sector. Well, I would suggest that having the poorest animal welfare standards in the whole of the UK when it comes to live export transportation would be a significant disadvantage to the reputation of our farming sector. If we're going to promote and support a dairy industry in Scotland, we need to be prepared to deal with the male offspring in an ethical and humane way. And that means channeling resources into calf at hoof dairying, making it standard practice that calves stay with their mothers until weaning. It means investing in a network of local and mobile abattoirs, and it means investing just a fraction of the millions we spend each year on food marketing schemes into creating a sustainable market for rosé veal and beef. And we could start right here in Parliament by switching our milk supply to an ethical calf at hoof dairy and putting rosé veal on our restaurant menus and I'm pleased that the Scottish Parliament corporate body are investigating the suggestion at present, and Edward Mountain will have an opportunity to taste this for himself. But leadership needs to come not just from the bottom, but from the top, and it's time for the Scottish Government to clearly state their position. Will they get behind the 73% of voters that support an export ban? Will they get behind the ethical dairy sector? Will they get behind the scientific evidence that says this practice needs to stop? Or will they continue to resist change at all costs and paint Scotland as a nation that puts cheap, high-volume production ahead of sustainability, ethics and animal welfare? Mike Rumbles, followed by Emma Harper. When Christine Graham uh, raised this issue earlier uh, in, a, uh, this year in a parliamentary question, I was heartened to hear Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary, confirm in this chamber that there were no live animal exports for slaughter from Scotland. This the minister confirmed to me the later meeting with him. I then had a meeting with representatives of Compassion and World Farming, who told me that contrary to what I was being led to believe by the minister, 5,000 calves were exported from Scotland to Spain via Northern Ireland for fattening and slaughter. Some of these animals also made their way to countries outside the EU where slaughter facilities and methods were not of the highest standards. I then wrote to Fergus Ewing about this, and I received a letter from him on the 7th of June where he said, and I quote, I'm disappointed that you were surprised to learn 
that around 5,000 calves are exported annually to Spain for fattening and production. Production being the euphemistic term, of course, for slaughter, no doubt. Even after 14 years in this parliament, I suddenly realized how naive I had been. I actually took Fergus Ewing's response to me at face value. Now, it's clear that Fergus Ewing didn't say anything about this which wasn't true. He was just clever with his statements, and in this context, I'm not particularly complimentary about the word clever. I have to ask, Deputy Presiding Officer, whether this is really the best way for a minister to respond to MSPs raising this important issue. I'll be very wary of what Fergus Ewing says in this chamber in the future. I, like others tonight, firmly believe that we must move to ending the live export of animals for slaughter. This should be industry-led. Our agricultural industry relies on public support. If we lose that public support, then we risk damaging brand quality Scotland. I am a little, um, I hope I'm not misunderstanding Edward, Edward Mountain, but I'm a little disappointed that I seem to get the idea that Edward Mountain, as a farmer, is somewhat skeptical, skeptical about tackling the issue. I said on a previous occasion in this chamber that public perception is really important. And I was shocked that some in the chamber at the time felt that this wasn't the case. They seemed to be more concerned to point out that what they felt were the inconsistencies in the recent BBC TV programme on the subject. Now, it's really important that we promote a commercial market for young calves in order to end the live exports of these animals. I think that's the way forward. I think calling simply for a ban isn't the way forward. This has to be a solution produced by the industry with help from the Scottish Government because that's what's going to be successful if we're going to move and satisfy what everybody wants to see. Uh, we want to see a situation where new markets are developed, where farmers make a profit, and where our issues addressing animal welfare are addressed properly. So it's really important that this commercial market for young calves, in order to end the live export, uh, is solved. For me, the answer lies in encouraging the development of the veal market. And all our efforts and the efforts of the industry should be focused on this. And that is particularly where the Scottish Government could help. And I, and I, and I hope that the Minister, in summing up the debate, could actually point to us solving this issue by appealing to the industry and supporting the industry and finding a market where, uh, that, to me, that's the most comprehensive solution that we could find. Thank you. Emma Harper, followed by Peter Chapman. Thank you, presiding officer. I would like to start by thanking Colin Smith for bringing this debate to chamber today because it does allow us the opportunity to discuss this really important subject and he used the word emotive in his speech and uh, it's actually noted in my notes that I've written in this afternoon to talk about this extremely emotive subject and it's one that we should approach in a measured, educated and evidence-based way. And I don't have the knowledge or credentials that Edward Mountain has, but I did grow up on two dairy farms. So I am familiar with the issue of male bull calves and uh, the importance that it is to everybody across, you know, across Scotland. So my dad used to say they weren't really worth that much, but I am aware that uh, we need to seriously look at this issue and uh, look at the aspects of the economics of keeping the bull calves or send them, sending them elsewhere. So I wanted to put forward an amendment to Colin's motion, so, which I did, because the government does have an expressed preference that animals should be killed as close to their farm of origin as possible. And um, Colin Smith's motion talks about 3,700 3,073 sheep, 5,595 calves, 661 cattle. But the information I obtained yesterday from the NFU, my contact was that out of the um, 38,700 male dairy calves registered in Scotland, 2,700 were transported. So there's some interesting numbers that might not reflect what is actually 
accurate. So I'd like to see some really accurate figures about what is happening because I know many dairy farmers that I have spoken to locally actually um, move their uh, dairy um, bull calves to other farms in Scotland to be reared. So I'm interested in hearing any work that the government has uh, engaged in to look at mobile abattoirs. Um, we've seen 34% reduction in the past two decades of abattoirs across the UK. And I've been doing some research myself on mobile abattoirs and uh, over the past two years as PLO to the Cabinet Secretary, I've engaged with many uh, dairy farmers about uh, other issues as well as this issue, including visiting many dairy farms across the southwest of Scotland and transport of animals over distances has been raised as an issue and the welfare of the animals in transit is absolutely a key issue no matter where the transport takes place, whether it's distance over land or distance overseas. So I'd be interested in further discussion around the model of mobile abattoirs which are currently in use in Sweden, Norway, France and Germany our European neighbours, and also the USA. Um, yes, I will. Yes. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, does the member agree that if a government is fully committed to the evidenced fact that animals are sentient beings, it would move as quickly as it possibly could to ban the live export of animals? Emma Harper. Um, thank you, Alison Johnson, for that uh, intervention. I'm aware that there's currently research that's being conducted by the Scottish Government to look at evidence and science and that's what I think any decisions would be made on rather than just any snap judgments. We should always look at the science and the evidence before making any informed decisions. Back to my mobile abattoir issue, um, some people comment that abattoirs are more ethical, they are used in accordance with strict animal welfare rules and regulations and less stress on animals may be a factor to consider. There is much more detail about it which would require a whole other debate but today I realise the time is short. Um, I spoke to Gary Mitchell who is the Vice President of the National Farmers Union yesterday and they are absolutely committed to engaging in this and he is actually attending a further meeting tomorrow to discuss the issues so I will be seeking from Gary what the discussion was at that meeting following that. So in conclusion I'd like to take the opportunity to again support NFU Scotland's call for evidence and science on the basis that any decision relating to transport of animals is made based on that and I would urge the Scottish Government to explore the possibility of mobile abattoirs which may benefit everybody including the issues of transportation of animals that are alive. Uh, just before I call Mr Chapman, uh, I still have uh, two speakers to call. Um, so I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes uh, to allow that. Can I invite Colin Smith uh, to move a motion without notice? Happy to move the motion, President Officer. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yeah. That is agreed. Thank you very much. And I now call Peter Chapman. I thank you, De Deputy Presiding Officer. And I must register an interest as a partner in a farming business and a member of the NFU. Now, as far as our, my farming business, was, we used to have a dairy herd. We had a dairy herd for a long number of years. We now no, don't have that, but we have a suckler cow herd at the moment. And I echo the sentiments of my colleague Edward Mountain in support for Emma Harper's amendment. And I hope all members across the chambers do the same. It is important that we back the continuation of live animal exports when necessary. We must back the Scottish livestock industry. We must back our farmers, the vast majority of whom see this as an important option, which must always be done to the highest standards. The transportation of live animals for export from Scotland is not something that should be used as a political pawn. We all agree we want the best animal welfare standards for our stock from birth to slaughter. And the welfare of animals reg regulations are there to ensure we maintain these standards for the small number of stock that require to be exported. Every farmer wants their animals to be slaughtered as close as possible to where they are born. But in some of Scotland's most remote rural areas, and particularly our islands, this is not possible. The recent closure of Orkney Slaughterhouse is a prime example of the difficulties faced by farmers in the, these remote locations. 
with no slaughterhouses locally, transferring livestock to the mainland for further fattening or slaughter is the only option. If we ban exports to the EU, 26 miles across the channel, how do we argue farmers in Shetland can continue to export livestock to Aberdeen, a distance 10 times further? Mm -hmm. We cannot close this door. It would be the end for livestock farming in our island communities. Absolutely. Colin Smith. Does the member accept that the point of the ban on the export of live animals out with the UK is once they leave the UK, once they reach another country, we no longer have control over the welfare of those animals and what happens to them then. In the UK we do, therefore no one is proposing we ban the transport of animals from the islands to mainland UK where we have control over those welfare standards. It's a ban on taking them out with the UK where we no longer have control. Maybe the member could explain that if the UK government who are carrying out a consultation on a ban, propose a ban for the rest of the UK, is he seriously saying Scotland should exempt itself and have a different policy? Peter Chapman. Scotland could have a different policy. And it's OK for Mr Smith to say that nobody's suggesting we, we shouldn't uh, shift li livestock off the islands. I would argue that some people would say, suggest that that's the next logical step if we ban it, ban it exporting them across the channel. The NFUS have stated that although live exports are a very small part of the Scottish trade, the option of well-managed and me, Mr. Chapman. exports Excuse should me. be retained. Could I ask that those members that are intent on shouting at each other across the chamber press their buttons, and I will give you a short time to speak if you wish. Mr Chapman. Thank you. This is particularly important as we move closer to Brexit. At this crucial time, the last thing we need is to close down potential export opportunities to mainland Europe. Now, many Scottish farmers are already struggling. The latest fig farming income figures show just how poor returns are for the farming industry. So the last thing we need is to put another economic disadvantage in their, pla in their place. There are many ways in which Scotland can continue to improve our reputation as being one of the best in the world for animal welfare standards without placing a ban on live animal exports. Continuing to back farm assurance schemes linking farms, transporters, markets and abattoirs in order to ensure the highest animal welfare standards right along the chain and ensuring rigorous enforcement of legislation is the way forward. In closing, presiding officer, this is an emotive debate for many which, an emotive debate for many which was prompted by the BBC Panorama programme to, which chose to sensationalise and try to put this trade in the worst possible light. It was in fact a disgraceful programme which lacked balance and even the most basic objectivity with the sole intention of damaging our reputation for high animal welfare. I'm closing. And for Ruth McGuire to assert that the, these calves are then exported to North Africa for slaughter is an absolute nonsense. There was absolutely no evidence for that. So, presiding officer, let me finish by making clear that Scotland's farmers work hard to maintain the highest level of animal welfare they care passionately about their animals and their welfare during any necessary journey. It is always taken very seriously. Thank you. Point of order, Claudia Beamish. I, uh, I thank you, presiding officer, and would like to highlight that um, the motion was in before, Colin Smith's motion was in before the BBC documentary. This has been an issue that we've been looking at for some time in Scottish Labour. It's just... It wasn't a point of order, but um, that is now on record. And the last of the open debate speakers is Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I declare an interest as convener of the Cross Party Group in Animal Welfare, congratulate Colin Smith on securing this debate and exclude animals exported for breeding from anything I say. I think it's appropriate, certainly for meat eaters, indeed also those who consume dairy produce like myself, to accept that animals such as dairy cows, pigs, sheep and so on are raised to be killed and in the main eaten by us. So if we are to eat them, the least we can do is to ensure their welfare from field to fork. And I agree with Colin Smith regarding our changing view of animals as sentient beings. But the key word, and these are not my words, are production. Like or not, the animals are products. So when there are bull calves born to a dairy cow, then they are, in quotes, byproducts, to be shot or shipped as it stands at the moment. A ban on live exports for slaughter, fattening for slaughter, however, has to be planned. All the instant ban by P&O did was to simply 
shift them to ports in England or for more to be shot. Now, the Scottish Government stated in reply to my topical question on 11th of September that it wants animals to be killed as close to the farm of origin as possible, as members opposite farmers have said. That's commendable, but from the statistics, that's not what's happening. For example, in 2017, now I don't know where Emma Harper got her figures, nearly over 5,000 cattle were exported to Spain for rearing as veal, and over 17,000 pigs were sent to Northern Ireland for slaughter. But I want to keep, I haven't got time, I want to keep to export as being beyond the UK shores. But I'm interested in what the Scottish Government is doing towards that aim, that commendable aim of from field to slaughter with the, the least travelling for the animals involved. Because we know that across Europe, the long distance transport of live animals destined for slaughter has long been recognised as one of the most serious and most intractable farm animal welfare problems. It is the case that the Scottish Government, even the UK Government, cannot monitor the welfare of these animals once they quit the UK shores. Now, there's no simple solution. I, I, you, I, please let me make a bit of progress. We've only got four minutes. There's no simple solution, and I accept that, uh, specifically on bull dairy calves, I hope the government, the farming community, Quality Meat Scotland and others, can find some way of bringing quality of life to these animals before slaughter so they can be then eaten. Now, I'm not an expert. I don't pretend to be an expert on some of the issues raised by the farmers in here. That's why they must be part of this discussion. And one of the discussions, and I know it was raised by Edward Mountain, is can there be any financial support to farmers who then are required to keep these bull calves for a period of time for consumption? These are matters to be explored. But collaboration is the key. And I want to take, uh, I mean, for me to take the heat out of it is something, but to take it out and take party politics out of this. And to this end, and Finlay Carson knows this, myself, Mark Ruskell, Mike Rumbles, Finlay Carson, and Colin Smith are trying to work together in collaboration to find a way to resolve this situation, which nobody is happy with, the farmers included. That was why, in fact, Mike Ruskell wrote to the corporate body on our behalf to see if we get Rose Veal put on the menu, why Finlay Carson has written to Quality Meat Scotland so the five of us can meet Quality Meat Scotland and see if there's some way of doing this. Because I want to see a time, as I'm sure we all do, whether for slaughter or fattening for slaughter, this takes place here in Scotland. And I say to Emma Harper, I've long campaigned for more local abattoirs in here as they became more centralised. This is not just for the animal's sake, ensuring slaughtering from layering to dispatch adheres to the highest welfare standards, but importantly, can be monitored by the Scottish Government. So in my view, the Scottish Government, when it said, quotes, no one is comfortable with the situation, should take a lead and fulfil its commitment to ensuring that animals that we raise for consumption are killed as close to field as possible and when exported on the hook, not the hoof. Thank you. I call Mary Goujon to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I think that uh, Christine Graham's contribution probably leaves the perfect note for me to follow on from because I feel like that was the, the note I was really hoping to strike tonight um, because I felt like I was agreeing with people I probably normally wouldn't agree with in this chamber and perhaps disagreeing with some others and um, because as Peter Chapman talked about in his debate you know it shouldn't be a political pawn and I would hope that this wouldn't be too much of a, a, a political situation here. I do genuinely want to thank Colin Smith for bringing forward this motion for debate this evening um, and to everyone for their con contribution so far. Uh, as Colin said right at the very start, we're all aware of how an emotive issue this is. And it's an issue that I've said about in this chamber before I care about and one I take extremely seriously. And that's why I'm glad to have the opportunity to respond to this debate and not just to respond to the issues that have been raised throughout the course of it, but also to talk about some of the work that has been going on since this was last raised in Parliament. Because I do genuinely believe that in the, across the chamber tonight, we're all trying to do exactly the same thing. And that's where I hope that we end up. I hope that we get to a point where we can work together to move forward on this issue and actually take positive action. Uh, but one thing that I've also learned in my uh, relatively short time in this role is that nothing is ever as clear-cut and straightforward as it can sometimes be made out to be. 
there are a lot of issues we'll have to take into consideration here um, around what is a very complex part of our farming industry. Um, but I would also at this point like to thank the wider stakeholders, both within the animal welfare sector and the farming industry, for all the constructive contributions on this issue. And I look forward to engaging with them in continued dialogue as we move forward. I think, again, there are a few things I just want to make clear before I really get into the main body of my response. In my role as Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment and representing the Scottish Government, we are absolutely committed to implementing and upholding the highest animal welfare standards. That's the case now. That will continue to be the case regardless of what happens post-Brexit. And I, I think it is also important to recognise that we do have to be able to transport animals by, by road and sea. I completely understand the point that Colin Smith made earlier about that. Um, but what we have to ensure is that during all of these journeys, regardless Regardless of what, of what they are for, the highest animal welfare standards that are currently in place are adhered to at all times. And I am confident that we do that. I, and lastly, we don't currently export any animals directly to Europe for slaughter. And there's no point in that, as Edward Mountain talked about in his contribution. And uh, as a, uh, quite a few members around the chamber have talked about tonight, we will always support the principle that ideally animals should be slaughtered as close to their farms of origin as is practical. Uh, that's Colin Smith talked about that, Peter Chapman, Christine Graham. Uh, but we do have to recognise the other factors that are at play within that. Now, Colin Smith talked about the potential for our cattle to move onwards beyond the EU, as did Ruth Maguire and, again, many other members across the chamber tonight. And I think one thing that I would like to talk about tonight is the, the Scottish Government research project that is currently being undertaken, because that is exactly why we are carrying out this work. Uh, because as Emma Harper talked about, we want to make policy based on evidence and policy that's supported by science, because I think it would be really irresponsible of us as a government if we did otherwise. Now, we've been aware of concerns around this trade for, for a, a number of years, and that's why we initiated an, an international monitoring project yeah. to gather evidence on the issue. And I don't think this project has been, had quite the recognition it deserves because I do believe it's the first uh, of its kind anywhere in the world. It's being undertaken by two of the top animal welfare scientists in Europe and will provide valuable up-to-date scientific evidence about the conditions for calves on export journeys. And the findings could make best practice recommendations for these journeys as well as recommendations that will be of great interest uh, more widely in Europe. But there is also the work which has been undertaken recently by the UK government, as again a, a number of members talked about tonight. The Scottish government supports DEFRA undertaking their call for evidence on the, regarding the transport of live animals for slaughter to continental Europe, as well as animal transport legislation in general. Now, as well as that public call for evidence, the DEFRA commissioned a systematic review of the scientific evidence on all livestock transport, which has, which has recently reported. And I understand that this evidence is being considered by the Farm Animal Welfare Committee, which is the UK-wide expert advisory body on farm animal welfare. So we very much look forward to the outcome once they have reviewed all that evidence. But the project that the Scottish Government have undertaken and the work that's been undertaken by the UK Government are just two strands of the work being done on this. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the issue of surplus dairy bull calves is complex, but the Scottish Government are working with the sector to look at all the options available to find a sustainable way forward. Now, we support initiatives such as the Ethical Dairy, who were mentioned in the BBC documentary in their pioneering approach. Oh, yes, of course. Edward Mountain. No, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, it's very interesting, this research, and I wondered if the research was going to look at uh, the requirement under the animal health regulations of uh, on-vehicle on inspections for drinking, ventilation systems, temperature monitoring, and monitoring of journey times to make sure that those were complied with because those are European-wide. And it'd be useful to know that that would inform this debate greatly, I believe. Absolutely, and I can confirm that uh, to Edward Mountain tonight. It will take all of that into consideration. Um, I was talking about the ethical dairy and their approach to keeping dairy cows and their calves together and I will be visiting them shortly to find out more about that. Now, their innovative work has been recognised by a recent food processing, marketing and cooperation grant scheme, which the scheme that Mark Ruskell mentioned earlier, uh, where they were awarded £160,000 to help expand their cheese production. Um, in terms of, now Claudia Beamish and Colin Smith both talked about how vital it is we work with industry. That's exactly what we've been doing. And contrary to Mark Duskell's claim that we are res we're resisting change, that, that's certainly not the case. Now, I, I'm afraid I really don't. Uh, 
Okay. If the, if the presiding officer... And, and, I, and I shall be generous, it's, Minister. It's, Christine it's, Green. it's so brief. I just wonder if somewhere in your summing up, you're going to mention abattoir facilities in Scotland, if that's part of your inquiries. Marie Gugio. I can confirm to the Chamber, I mean, no stone will be left unturned when it comes to this issue. And we are looking at, uh, trying to look at this from, from all angles. Um, now, I've personally undertaken a number of visits to dairy farms in different parts of the country with a, a great number more planned. And I'm visiting a range of dairy farms, so the big, the small, the organic, non-organic, to find out more about how their businesses operate and what happens to their bull calves. And if there's one thing I've learned so far, there is no sim simple single solution that can easily apply across the whole dairy sector. Now, every farm, of, I'm really afraid I don't have time, but... Really <laughs> Will the presiding officer indulge me? Oh, why not have indulged everybody else? Peter Chapman. Let me suggest that the best way forward to, to, to find a solution to this problem is for, to encourage more use of sex semen on, on dairy cows. And then you get, a, you get a, a, a heifer calf and then you put your other cows to a, dairy, to a beef bull. Mary Gujo. Mr Chapman has kindly covered a point that I was going to come to just, just shortly, if I, if I ever managed to make progress. So, but thank you for these points. Now, um, so yeah, as I say, there isn't a simple single solution to it all. Now, every farm I've been to so far has been different. Some sell their calves, some wean them until they're 12 months old. Uh, others can't sell them on because of the kind of contracts that they can be on with supermarkets. But a universal problem that I've encountered so far is the increase in costs impacting their businesses. The costs of feed, for example, have almost doubled. It's that, amongst other costs, that deter some from actually being able to hold on to their calves at the moment. For others, they're restricted by space and would need the capital spend for infrastructure to house the extra calves should they keep them on. But now, and this is where I completely agree with the point that Mike Rumbles made uh, earlier on, which was a vitally important point. Now, we could uh, uh, ban exporting animals for further production, but I do think that if we're to be a responsible government, there isn't any way we could do that without first considering the wider impact that that would have on the dairy sector, where many farms are under extreme pressure already, or which could just lead to more bull calves uh, simply being killed. I am, in saying that, there are so many other positive initi initiatives and developments underway. As I've already mentioned, there's the ethical dairy and their approach. I met another farmer who wasn't a dairy farmer, but who is purchasing dairy bull calves for the first time uh, to see what he can do with them in terms of further production. There's also the scientific pro progress in this area when it comes to breeding. And I would commend the good progress that the wider dairy industry is making in developing strategies to reduce the number of surplus dairy bull calves. And key to that is the likes of sex semen used to breed dairy cows, which has been mentioned by Peter Chapman and Edward Mountain too. It does have its own drawbacks. Um, it's considered to be more expensive. It's not available for all bulls, but again, it is another option that's there. And there are also a number of other innovative projects coming forward uh, through the Rural Innovation Support Service. Now, I'm keen to get out and meet as many dairy farmers as possible to hear about their concerns and their views on the future of the industry, because I'm not going to stand here for one minute uh, and pretend I'm a farmer. Uh, that's why I want to get out and about as much as possible to try and understand the operation of the dairy industry as best I can and to see where those different pressures are. Now, I mentioned earlier that I've started making visits and I have a programme of more visits over the coming weeks, including to the ethical dairy. I've met with the NFUS and Quality Meat Scotland to discuss this and we'll soon be meeting with one kind and compassion in world farming to discuss the issue with them so just to bring that to a conclusion i've said this before in chamber this is a situation that no one's happy with there i know that there are so many issues that that come up in this chamber where in our political parties we do have fundamentally different uh, and opposed points of view but i genuinely do not see this as, as one of those issues because i genuinely believe we're all trying to do the same thing and i do hope that we can take the politics out of this situation because i for one am willing to work across the chamber on this issue and i hope that i've, I've shown that through the work that that I've undertaken so far and through the, the commitment that I've made to this tonight. I want us to find a way forward working with our farmers in the dairy industry whilst upholding the highest standards of animal welfare. Thank you. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.